Family Life Canada, Pastor Dan DeGaris. Woo! Good morning. It's uh, good to see you this morning. Well, listening in on the singing and everything kind of made us a little homesick. It's great to see everyone and participate in the service. Worship team, awesome job as uh, usual. And uh, hats off to the tech team who was able to pull all this off. Uh, greatly appreciate your uh, ministry as well. Uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, just express our thanks to you for your prayers and for your support. Uh, you know, this past year, there have been people who have come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. There are um, marriages, uh, relationships, families that have been strengthened. Uh, there are individuals and uh, couples that have been equipped to be able to turn around and teach others. And uh, uh, we've been working on some new materials. It's been a very fruitful year. It's been a challenging year, but it's been a fruitful year. And we look forward to what uh, God will continue to build in the days to come. I uh, The question on whether or not Christmas is still relevant today. Has the true meaning of Christmas been lost? I, uh, you know, these really aren't new questions. Charles Dickens in his book, The Christmas Carol, touched on them in 1843. And almost 60 years ago, Charlie Brown asked the same question. Remember in, uh, uh, well, what was the show called? Charlie Brown Christmas. It was one of the two shows he used to watch as a child. Uh, every Christmas. There was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and there was Charlie Brown. Well, uh, if you remember the start of the Charlie Brown Christmas, he was, he was sad. He was depressed. And he got more and more depressed whenever he bumped into his friends, because all of them seemed to be obsessed with gifts and money. Lucy, his friend, wanted real estate. Sally uh, was writing out her Christmas letter to Santa. And uh, she had a whole list of stuff that she wanted. And uh, instead, she said, you know what? Instead of the gifts, why don't you just give money? Uh, make it 10s and 20s. And she went on to say that uh, uh, she wanted what was coming to her, her fair share, uh, fair share. Even Snoopy, Charlie Brown's dog, had entered into a neighborhood light contest in the hopes of winning some cash. Lucy tells him, look, Charlie Brown, let's face it. We all know that Christmas is a big commercial racket. Well, Charlie Brown becomes more and more frustrated and uh, until he all of a sudden bursts out and he said, isn't there anyone here who can tell me what Christmas is all about? His friend Linus steps up in front of everybody, clutching his blanket as usual, but with no fancy background, no special music. Lioness simply quotes seven lines from this passage, including, concluding with glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And then there's a brief moment of silence and then he turns, looks at Charlie Brown and says, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. The show intentionally broke through all the commercialism and spoke the truth as to what Christmas is about. And this morning, I would like to invite you to turn to that passage. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to Luke chapter 2. If you have your phones, you can uh, look up the passage there. Uh, whatever way you carry the word of God. But look it up because we're going to do a Bible study. We're going to take a look at that passage. There's going to be no lights, no PowerPoint, uh, just the word of God. And may God's spirit break through all the clutter of life and the Christmas season. And may truth nourish our souls and encourage our hearts. So we look at Luke chapter 2. And it starts off a 
sorry, I got Norton, uh, Norton uh, security flashing all over my screen here. It starts off in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. You know, Octavian was actually his actual name, but he insisted that people call him Caesar Augustus. Why? Because Augustus means great. It means magnificent. And he's the greatest, most powerful man on the face of the earth. And out of that power, he issues this decree that a census should be taken and the whole Roman world bowed to his demand. As required in verse three, everyone went to his hometown to register. And interestingly enough, records have been found of this decree in Egypt. Caesar Augustus was a historical figure. This decree was a historical fact, an historical event. It all happened. And among those impacted by this decree was a young couple who lived in the town of Nazareth. In verse four, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the house of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, there's a whole lot more going on here than simply Augustus issuing a decree and a young expecting couple having to go to Bethlehem. To help us picture what's, what's happening and to relate it to everyday life. Think about watching a parade and maybe you went to a Santa Claus parade or something and you were standing there next to the road on a curb what do you see all you see is what's passing by in front of you or else maybe a little bit of what's coming mary and joseph in a sense are at the parade level and this will make sense as we develop it they're standing at the parade level and all they see is the here and now they see the decree they recognize the fact that Mary is expecting. They understand the, the impact that this decree is going to have on them. They're going to have to travel 144 kilometers from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. Even though she's going to be uh, going to have a child shortly. There's no Uber, there's no bus service. They have to walk that distance or else ride the back of a donkey. This was the last thing they needed. What else could go wrong? Now, instead of looking at it from the curb side view, let's go up into a helicopter. And if you're looking at a parade from a helicopter, you can see the whole parade. You can see the beginning. And you can see the end all at the same time. Mary and Joseph can't see this. And from high above, God sees the beginning and the end. And we're going to take a look at it from his vantage point. And we're going to go back towards the beginning. Six, seven hundred years before Augustus and his decree. And at that time, God declared through the prophet Micah, out of Bethlehem would come one who would be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And Mary was carrying this very child that Micah was talking about. The one whose origins are from old. The one from ancient times. The only problem is Mary and Joseph are living in Nazareth and the child is to be born in Bethlehem. Augustus may have been the most powerful man on the face of the earth when he issued this decree. It's a huge inconvenience to Mary and Joseph. But in reality, God is the one that is in control. All the prophecies, not just this one in Micah, but all the prophecies that uh, foretold of, the, of uh, uh, the virgin being with child, the line of David, the star, the birth in Bethlehem, even the timing of the 
birth itself. We're all foretold. And when the decree was issued, Mary and Joseph ended up where God said they would be according to his plan. Scripture describes God as sit, sitting enthroned above the cir uh, circle of the earth. It's people like you and I. It's people like Augustus, as great and powerful as he is. Or it's nothing but a grasshopper, Scripture describes. We're all like grasshoppers. God speaks, and it happens. Today, as you stand on the curb looking at the parade in life, what do you see? Maybe you see what's in the news. You're overwhelmed by what you see and what you hear. Maybe you see hurting people. Maybe you see the challenges that you are facing in life. Maybe things are looking pretty messed up. And it's hard to tell how all those pieces are going to fit together. But our sovereign God, who sees the beginning from the end, is in control. And everything will turn out exactly the way God says it will. And living out life here on the edge of the curb isn't always going to be easy. It isn't always going to be convenient. And we can just take a look at the story of Mary and Joseph for that. It's going to require a walk of faith so that whatever we are facing right now, let's keep our eyes on God. Let's remember that he is in control. Let's remember that he sees the beginning from the end. And let's remember that it's going to unfold just as he says it will. In verse 6 and 7, as we go on, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The shepherds were told three things about this baby. Look at uh, verse uh, 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The shepherds were told he's the Savior, he's the Messiah, and he's the Lord. The Savior, the one who would deliver them. You and I, the whole world, he's a Savior. I, uh, to help illustrate this, our need for the Savior, I'd like you to imagine for a moment that this uh, disc is a story of my life. Everything I've ever said, everything I've ever done, everything I've ever thought is recorded here on this disc. Now, if I was to give this disc, pass it on to you, say, here's Sherry. And Sherry was to take it put it in the DVD player and shine it up on the screen. There's a few things on here that I wouldn't mind you seeing at all. There's some stuff on here that I'd kind of be maybe even a little proud of. And you could say, hey, look at me. I, I shoveled the neighbor's sidewalk yesterday. Or uh, uh, there's there's me uh, teaching a Sean class or, or uh, there, there's me uh, uh, speaking or working with the indigenous or, or whatever. So all these things that uh, uh, are good things we projected up there and that'd be okay with me. But there's also some things on here that I uh, 
wouldn't want you to see. They'd say, hey, Sherry, could you uh, fast forward that? Could you turn that off? I don't want you to see these things. And what are those things? Those things are sin. Wrongdoings. Things that break the heart of God. And you don't have to look so surprised. You've got your own CD or DVD. And you've got your things that you would not want to be showing up on the screen as well. You've sinned. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And this here is our problem. This is what stands between myself and God. This is what interferes with the relationship between the two of us. And there's nothing that I can do to remove those sins. They're there. And I can do a whole lot of good deeds and add, uh, add those good deeds to this DVD, but the sin still remains. So I can't do anything about it. If something's going to be done that would enable me to be able to have that relationship with God, then it's going to be up to God. And this is what God did in the sending of his son, Jesus, as that little baby in a manger. Jesus came from heaven above, came and he died upon the cross. The word of God tells us that we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has gone his own way, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all, the sin of us all. And that sets me free to be able to have that relationship with God. We need we need a savior. You need a savior. The world desperately needs a savior. And that's who came that first Christmas. That's who came and was, was born and was laid in that manger. Our savior. The shepherds tell us, or the angels say that uh, today is born in the town of David. A savior. It's also the Messiah. And... Uh, for those of you who have taken Sean, what does Messiah mean? What is the Messiah? He's the Christ. He's the anointed one. He's the one, the king, that rules over the kingdom of God. He's our savior. He's the Messiah. And he's also the Lord, the owner, the one who has absolute control, the one whom we surrender to. So Jesus, the uh, Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born, the angel announces. And then the angel goes on and says, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And then suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Must have been an awesome experience to have that angel making the uh, the announcement. And then all these other angels come in and it's like a backup band and choir. And they start singing away. Glory to God in the highest. And when the angels had left and gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another. Let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened. Which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. You know, instead of going to Bethlehem, the shepherds could have easily stayed in the field. They got a job to do. And hearing the news of Jesus' birth and listening and seeing those angels would have been quite an experience. 
would have been something that uh, they could go home and tell their family about. It was something that they would remember for the rest of their lives. Something to really rejoice in. But if they had done that, they would never have met the Savior. They made a decision. Let's go find him. It's Christmas. Lots of people have heard the angel's message announcing Jesus' birth. Yeah, they may not have seen the angels, but they've heard the message that Jesus is born. And they've perhaps attended Christmas Eve services or Sunday services. They've maybe read the Bible occasionally. But many have never bothered to do what the shepherds did. To go find Jesus. To respond to that message. And go to meet him and get to know him. And in some ways, many celebrate Christmas standing out in the field. Doing their own thing. Never ever entering into the presence of the one it is all about. When I was a child, my uh, parents and Sunday school teachers told me all about Jesus. And I knew in my head that he was the son of God, that he was born of a virgin, that he healed people, that he died on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose again from the dead. It's a wonderful story and all that knowledge Information is great, but head knowledge doesn't save us. You know, uh, James in the book of James says, you believe there is one God? Great. That's good. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. It wasn't until I re responded to what was being said and asked Jesus to come into my life that he became my savior. And instead of being the savior that's pictured in a manger on a Christmas card, he became my savior, my Messiah, my Lord. And so I wonder, who is Jesus to you this Christmas? Is he still the savior on a Christmas card? Or is he your savior? Do you know about Jesus, but not Jesus himself? If so, seek him out. Seek him out. The invitation is being extended constantly. The Lord would love to have us be a part of his family, to know Jesus, and to grow in our relationship with him. It makes you wonder as you look at this story of why he chose, why God chose shepherds to see and hear his angelic announcement and why they were the first to see Jesus. You know, I'm not sure of all the reasons and we could spend a lot of time talking about it, but I would like to just touch on a couple of things. You know, shepherds were considered to be unclean. In other words, if the shepherds got off work, and they were on their way home, and the temple was between work and, and their home. And uh, they would be unable to walk into the temple and enjoy a worship service. They would be considered unclean. Their religion wouldn't allow it. And yet here they are, being invited by the angelic hosts to enter into the presence of God. This is their savior. In many ways, the shepherds represent mankind. When Jesus came to earth and 
grew up and walked amongst people. He had compassion on them because they were, were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Over 2,000 years later, not much has changed. People are still wandering around helpless and harassed. Everyone's doing what is right in their own eyes. They all embrace their own truth. Many are dealing with addictions to relieve pain, to relieve shame, to escape reality. Many are looking for love in all the wrong places. Many have lost identity. Some don't even know if they are male or female. But the answer remains the same. The Savior has been born. He's been born to you. He is the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. And he brings healing. He brings identity. He brings purpose. He brings salvation. The Christ of Christmas is needed more than ever before. No matter what we have done or who we are, we are like the shepherds. We've heard of Jesus' birth and the invitation has been extended to come and meet the Savior and get to know him. Verse 17, as we read on, as we continue to study his word, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So the shepherds go out and proclaim what they had seen and, and heard. What they know of the Savior. Like the shepherds in 1965, Charles Schultz, creator of Peanuts, the creator of Charlie Brown, dared to spread the word about this child through his peanut characters. You know, the network and some of his creative partners tried to stop him. They didn't want him going in that direction. They told him that the story as he was telling it wouldn't appeal to the TV audience. They told him it wasn't what the audience wanted. They told him it really wasn't what they wanted. It wouldn't last. But Schultz insisted he pushed it through. And almost 65 years later, it is still on TV. Why? I think it's because while the viewer may be obsessed with holiday shopping and all that Christmas has become, all that the world has made Christmas to be, they are actually starving for spiritual meaning. In the midst of all the commercialism, the show breaks through, if even for just a brief moment, and souls are nourished. It strikes a need within the heart. The story of Jesus' birth can transform us through his presence. If you watch Linus, and if you've got the, the show, you might want to keep your eye on him. All the way through the show, he's holding on to this little security blanket and his thumb is, is in his mouth. Almost all the way through his show. And Lucy comes up to him at one point and hands him a script for the Christmas play. And Linus said, I can't, I can't learn lines. But when Charlie Brown asks that question and says, uh, can't anyone tell me the meaning of Christmas? Linus is the one who gets up on, on the, in the middle of the stage in front of all of his friends, in front of all those who know him. And with no lights and no special music or anything like that, he begins to recite this passage. And at one point, while he's, he's uh, uh, proclaiming the word of God, he lets his blanket drop to the ground. He knows 
He knows in whom he believes. He knows where his security is found. He knows where real hope is. And whether we take the time, like the shepherds did, to seek Jesus out and let him be our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord, has been left totally up to us, just as it always has been. We, like the shepherds, like Charles Schultz, have a message to proclaim. And Christmas is an awesome opportunity to be able to proclaim that message. Because the hearts are opened. There's a search for the true meaning of what Christmas is all about. The shepherds met, as we read on, the shepherds met Jesus. And then in verse 20, it says, they returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen, or all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This Christmas, let us not uh, rejoice because of what we've been told. Just what we've been told, but let us also rejoice because what we have seen, what we've heard, and what we have embraced. Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord, is alive. He's alive. And he's the one our world needs. Let us bow together in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the Christmas story. But it's not about Christmas. It's about you, Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for being obedient, coming to this earth, living and teaching, dying upon that cross, and thank you for rising again. Our hope is in you. We thank you for the gift of salvation that you have provided, freely provided for us. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace. This is not something we can earn. It's not something that we deserve. It is something that you and your love and your wonder have given to us as a gift. And through Jesus, you invite us to be a part of your family, to, to have you as our Heavenly Father. And Lord, we thank you that you forgive us, that our sins are removed from us as far as the east is from the west. And we can stand before you because of Jesus, without fault, without blemish. Not because of our good deeds, but Lord, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your gift. And I pray, Father, for my friends here. That this Christmas would be a wonderful time with you. A time of celebration, a time of thanksgiving. For all, all that is ours in you, Lord Jesus. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you and to share with you. We're going to miss uh, being able to hang around after the service, having uh, lunch or whatever it is that you've prepared for today. But uh, our hearts are, are with you. May God bless you and your families. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Thank you. We miss you. <laughs> uh, indeed, the relevance of Christmas is that Jesus, the baby, is still alive today. Amen? Amen. Yes. Uh, although I'm not sure if the Charlie Brown is relevant to the young people. <laughs> Do you guys know who Charlie Brown is? <laughs> yeah, there's a slow death of comics now. So, but yeah, Charlie Brown was my favorite, one of my favorite cartoon uh, strip. Uh, and it's just, it has a lot of Christian um, messages in those comics uh, stories. Uh, so now is the time to share if you have any blessings that you have received and if you have any uh, feedback to the message. 
Uh, thank you again, Pastor Dan. It was a really good uh, message reminding us of the relevance of Christmas. Maybe I can start. Uh, I'd like to praise the Lord because uh, last night I had a Bible study.